Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Evergreen Conference. Andrea and I are going to welcome you to the conference this morning and get us started. Uh, so I see a lot of people introducing themselves in the chat, and I know it is quite early on the West Coast, so we're thrilled to have everyone with us today. Uh, let's see. Andrea, do you want to share your screen or do you want me to leave this up? Some slides, so I'll okay. share my screen, please. Confirming that you all are looking at a beautiful large logo of the Evergreen uh, International Conference. So <clears throat> thank you, Katie, and, uh, and welcome everyone to the 2021 Evergreen International Conference. Um, I'm Andrea von Snyman, and I've had the privilege this year of serving as conference chair. So as we all know, last spring, uh, the reality of pandemic crashed down on us and the 2020 conference, which was in progress for over a year, was one of the many events that was called off. Um, in an effort to snatch conference victory from the jaws of defeat, there was a mad scramble on behalf of a uh, kind of motley crew of evergreeners from the conference committee and the outreach committee. And the event that we all pulled together in six short weeks went almost in, entirely without a hitch, uh, thanks to amazing community effort. This wasn't, uh, still is something that we should be proud of. And I still am a little bit amazed that we pulled that off last year. Um, Unfortunately, by late 2020, it became apparent that we could no longer reliably count um, on the safety of an in-person 2021 event, and the board and local planning committee made the difficult decision to cancel the planned Kansas City Conference. The outreach committee was once again tapped to head up the online conference, and a slightly less motley crew took up the reins. This time, we had six months instead of six weeks, and we were able to proceed with a good bit more structure than 2020's Mad Dash. Uh, personally, I'm really sad that we've missed gathering together two years in a row. This may say something about how I need to have more of a social life, but um, the Evergreen Conference has always been one of the social highlights of my year, truly. Uh, I've attended every single one since Athens in 2009. And I know that we've all really been struggling to navigate interpersonal relationships uh, in a changed world and, and find this new normal. And I miss seeing every single one of you in person. But that said, there are definitely things that are easier with an online event. Um, the cost of putting on an online event is significantly lower um, than an in-person event. Things like live captioning and video recording can be cost prohibitive to do at an in-person event of our size. Online, these are far more easily achievable, which gives us an event that is both more accessible as well as lets us preserve the content for future community members and those who can't attend. Um, the lower costs and online platform also mean that the overall attendee cost is much lower and also easier for people to attend who can't get away uh, for a week for an in-person event. This year, I'm pleased to say that we actually have uh, our, some presenters uh, presenting from the European Union um, that I don't think would have been able to make it to an in-person conference. So we're really thrilled that we've been able to expand the reach of this event thanks to being able to do it online. So I do hope that we can gather in person again soon. Um, but I also hope that the community continues to offer online events, either as part of in person events or as their own thing, since it does provide a different way of reaching community members globally. So to return to that slightly less motley crew, here we are for your viewing pleasure. Uh, at an in person event, I would embarrass them all by making them stand up awkwardly. So maybe this is another plus for an online event. Um, by the way, almost every single one of these people on your screen are not only conference committee members, but several of them are also Evergreen Project board members, committee and interest group leaders, conference presenters or panelists, and conference moderators. Some of these people are several of those things, um, and those people we like to say don't like to sleep. Uh, while I get to call myself chair, uh, I want you all to make no mistake that this was a group effort and these people all deserve a ton of credit for figuring out how to put on a large scale online event, including formal sponsorships, social events and an exhibit space. So a huge thanks to all the committee members for your creativity, uh, dedication and hard work. Thank you. Speaking of people to thank, I would like to be among the first to thank our event sponsors. Their support of the conference and the Evergreen community is very, very appreciated. Thank you first to our champion sponsors. The platform that you're all on, Hopin, has been sponsored by the Evergreen Community Development Initiative. 
closed captioning, which is being provided by Caption Access, has been sponsored by Mobius. Thank you to both of these organizations for being our top level sponsors in 2021. Next, I'd like to thank our advocate sponsors. Yesterday's pre-conferences were sponsored by COOL, the Consortium of Ohio Libraries, and today's keynote presentation is sponsored by Equinox Open Library Initiative. Thank you to both of these organizations as well. I also want to thank our ally sponsors, Bibliomation, Emerald Data Networks, Markive, Kipu, Stack Courier, and Unique Management Services. Thank you all for your support of the conference and our community. I will wrap up with some conference practicalities, but before that, I'd like to turn the floor over to Jason Boyer, Evergreen Project Board Chair, for a few brief remarks. Jason? Thank you, Andrea. And uh, as those of you who know me fairly well may be surprised, they will quite be brief. <laughs> Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome again to the 2021 Evergreen Online Conference. It's good to um, basically see you all here in a manner of speaking. I'm excited for what the committee and the presenters have put together for us all this week. I'm certain that this will be a great conference with a lot of valuable lessons to take away. So a lot, <laughs> a lot has happened in the last year, and there were even a couple of good things you uh, might have missed if you were distracted for any reason. The Evergreen Project is now a full 501c3 entity as of September 2020. And we've also had some great releases with 3.5, 3.6, and this year's 3.7, bringing features like uh, new Angular interfaces to the client, uh, an entirely new OPAC skin, curbside delivery, new search suggestions based on the records you actually have in your system and not spell check. So, some pretty uh, nice stuff. <laughs> I asked Andrea not to give me too much time to fill, and she's very kindly obliged. But uh, before I go, I did want to reiterate uh, how great it is to always see the community come together and share knowledge and experience online and in person. I do hope that these online events continue and possibly become more frequent. Uh, but after this week, what I'll be looking forward to most is uh, sitting at the crowded table in a hotel restaurant discussing database performance or arguing about type systems or maybe just finding out whether or not the pizza is any good at the place down the street. So looking forward to seeing how this week goes and seeing you all in the future. Thank you all and have a great Evergreen Online Conference. Thank you so much, Jason. So I'm going to wrap up with a few practicalities about the conference and then the platform, and then I uh, will turn it over to the keynote. So first, a few notes about the schedule. Um, all conference events are hosted here on Hopin, where you are now. Um, there's it would be helpful to think of sessions as rooms, so as physical spaces. And then when you click on a session, that will let you access the individual presentations. Um, there are sessions for track one and track two. There's a special session for this opening keynote, and then that will also be used for the closing. There's uh, also sessions, separate sessions for lightning talks. There are also open discussion rooms for cataloging documentation and dev and sysadmin. We're gonna have uh, exhibits today through Thursday and exhibit hours will be 12 to 4 p.m. Eastern. And then lightning talks will be today at 3.30 Eastern and tomorrow at 2.30 Eastern. The sign-up sheet will be posted in the hop-in reception room. There's also going to be gaming and social time because what is an Evergreen Conference without game night? Um, you might have seen in the reception room some uh, social rooms built there and that will be Wednesday uh, the 26th, that's tomorrow, seven to nine Eastern in the evening. So please join us um, to come hang out and play games. And then there's also the development and documentation hack fests, which will be Friday the 28th all day. Uh, if you haven't signed up for those, you can still do so, and those are uh, free to attend. And information about that is on our website. So I mentioned exhibits, and we're thrilled this year that we're able to provide an online exhibit space. And we're thankful to our eight exhibitors listed here. I definitely encourage you to visit the expo area of Hopin and visit the exhi exhibitions. Um, the main exhibit hours, as I mentioned, are today through Thursday, 12 to 4 p.m. 
Uh, some exhibitors are also maintaining uh, doing demos at certain scheduled times. So please check the main conference schedule page on the Evergreen website for information about specific ex exhibitor hours and scheduled demo times. So I mentioned that uh, one of the things we can do more readily in an online event is recording and captioning. So be aware, um, you were told this when you were signed up, but most sessions will be recorded. This included yesterday's free conferences, um, as well as lightning talks, keynote, and conference presentations. We will be posting these recordings uh, within the next couple of weeks on the Evergreen YouTube channel, as well as the transcripts from our captioners. Um, slides will be presented, posted on the program descriptions page of the conference website. And this is just a nudge to presenters. Uh, please email your slides to the Evergreen conference list um, as you finish them. We'll start nagging you again in a week or so about that. So um, most events will also be live captioned. The moderators will post live caption links at the beginning of each presentation. Uh, interest group meetings will not be captioned or recorded, and Hackfest discussion rooms and social events will also not be captioned or recorded. So just know where the parameters are there. Next, the code of conduct and video policy. This code of conduct um, applies to everyone associated with this event in every space that is part of the event, which includes discussion rooms and social events. Um, in case you uh, encounter an incident, please contact a responder that uh, to let them know. Please be aware that um, all of the responders on that page are also presenters, so you may need to email two of them at once or something like that um, if you have anything to report. So we, hopefully we won't need that, but we do always want to make sure that's available at every event. This is also this event is also subject to the community photo and video policy. And please note that the board did approve some changes to this um, policy this year due to online events. We did talk about coming up with a green, yellow, red border around everyone's uh, avatar box, but that kind of became a little complicated. So just know that cameras are always optional for all speakers and attendees. You do not have to ever share your camera if you do not want to. Um, and in fact, in most moderated sessions, you will need moderator approval to share your camera or speak. Um, and just make sure that um, you're careful screen sharing if you are screen sharing. And I am okay with you all seeing my, my slightly cluttered office behind me, but just be aware of what's behind you if you're sharing your screen. Uh, finally, social media. If you're active on social media, please give us a follow. Uh, if you post about the conference, please use the official hashtag of uh, EVGILS21. And last but certainly not least, thanks to all of you, everyone who is speaking, presenting, moderating, attending, leading a discussion, um, and all of the other ways in which you make this a viable community. Thank you so much, and thank you for being a part of this event. I'm now going to turn it over to Katie Greenleaf Martin to introduce Becky Yost, our keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea and Jason, for the welcome and remarks. I am thrilled this morning that we have uh, Becky Yost with us, and she is the founder of Library Data Privacy Consul Consultant, founder of and Library Data Pro Privacy Consultant for, excuse me, LDH Consulting Services, a consultancy that helps libraries and vendors navigate the intersection of library data and privacy. For over a decade, Becky has wrangled library data in its various forms in academic and public libraries. She received her MLIS from University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2008 and has been a certified information privacy professional in the United States with the International Association of Privacy Professionals since 2018. You can find her online at yobj.net and you should definitely follow her on Twitter at yo underscore bj. I want to th say thank you again to our keynote sponsor, Equinox Open Library Initiative, as well as to our champion sponsors, the Evergreen Community Development Initiative and Mobius. Welcome, everyone. And I'm thrilled to hand it over to Becky for her keynote presentation, The Curious Case of Library Data Policy. All right. Thank you, Katie. And welcome, everyone. So it's just going to be a little bit before. Uh, let me get my slides set up for you all. All right. You should all be seeing my slide deck. So welcome, everyone. 
thank you so much for joining us today. And I do see there are some West Coast folks who are along with me. I'm in Seattle, so I hope you have your coffee or tea ready. Um, thank you for joining us. And I wanna give special thanks to the conference committee for the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, planning a virtual conference is as difficult, convoluted, complex as getting an in-person conference all together without a pandemic on top of everything. So thank you to the conference committee for making this conference a reality for today. Now, while I'm sad that I can't meet everyone in person, I'm still happy to have the chance to see you all in the virtual world. And unfortunately, speaking of pandemics, you probably hear a little bit of construction. The pandemic hasn't stopped construction season in Seattle, so I do apologize for the construction noises as they come and go during the session. I live and work on the unceded territory um, traditional land of the Duwamish people, the first people of Seattle. The Duwamish tribe were the first signatories of the Treaty of Point Elliot in 1855. However, the tribe has been, has been denied the rights established in the treaty for over 165 years to this day. The United States federal government currently does not recognize the Duwamish tribe, denying the tribe the rights and protections of federal recognition. The Duwamish tribe are still here. The people are still here and they're living on their land. A portion of the speaker's fee from the conference will be donated to Real Went Duwamish. Real Went serves as a way for people occupying this land to provide financial compensation to the tribe for use of their land and resources. The tribe has started a petition to send our state, to send to our state Congress people to create and support a bill in Congress that would grant the tribe federal recognition. The link to the petitions on the slide, it's www.standwiththeduwamish.org. You're more than welcome to join me in donating to real rent or signing the petition today. There are a couple of housekeeping notes before we begin. There will be issues that pertain specifically to the United States version of librarianship, which might not track with your experiences with librarianship where you're located, since this is an international conference. I use a lot of citations and references for this talk, so you can find the citations and references for this talk on the URL on the slide, which is is.gd forward slash evgils21 Y -O -O -S -E. This talk also contains references to abuse, racism, sexism, sexual assault, and rape culture. Do what you need to do to take care of yourself during this talk, even if it's just closing out of the browser right now and then coming back to the recording when you feel better prepared to deal with those topics. And lastly, I will not be taking questions at the very end of this talk. However, you can still reach me on Twitter or email if you have questions. And with that, let's begin. Welcome to the obligatory origin story. The one where I tell you that I loved books as a kid. I got lost in reading all the time. I practically lived in the public library and living my lifelong dream of being a librarian. Well, that's not my story. I was the kid who would watch weather radar or news channels for hours. I snuck into my brother's room to study the off-brand 1980s personal computer and dot matrix printer. It took over an hour for that printer to print a tree with three colors, but I was going to watch that printer print from beginning to end. See, you don't understand. It was three colors. A, a tree with three colors and the dot matrix printer. So. In all, I wanted to know how everything worked. The introduction to the World Wide Web in my teens was a game changer for a kid living on a farm in Wisconsin. I practically lived in Yahoo directory pages. I delved into HTML, CSS, and BASIC. But while the computer um, computers were located in the library, I didn't do much of this learning in library spaces. There was that one time where I was asked to leave the public library, 
the library worker either didn't approve of me posting an admittedly teen angsty poem that I found in a student publication that I felt the need as a teenager to share with the world, or more likely, I violated library computer use guidelines by posting to the discussion forum on a public computer. Now, did I mention that my oldest sister, the one who was supposed to be the librarian in the family, worked at the public library and was there when I was asked to leave. So that was a little bit awkward. Fast forward a few years. I ended up working at my undergraduate university library. I started shelving books, which gave me an excuse to explore the collection. I haven't been in a collection that big. So to me, it was like walking through that analog version of Yahoo directories. How did it become arranged this way though? What were the processes? and structures that collected, organized, and made these resources discoverable to patrons. So in all, how did a library actually function? It was then I was introduced to technical services and library metadata. And from there, the rest was history. Shortly after graduating with my comparative studies and religion degree, I went to University of Wisconsin-Madison for library school, specializing in organization of information and technology. I went from creating applications for catalogers and technical services, to administering library systems, to library IT management. But now most of my work deals with data privacy. So you all might be wondering, what is so special about library data and privacy that I have made a career choice to focus on that? When you work in technical services or IT, you'll quickly realize that you can't have a library without metadata. There have been times where defunding tech services prompted thoughts about deleting the ILS database, which would then bring down the library catalog and other patron services. Now, while this thought was mainly therapeutic and not an actual plan to pull the data place plug, that's the official disclaimer here, um, there was no plan, actual plan. It does illustrate how this data is vital for libraries. You need metadata to make your resources discoverable and accessible to your patrons, and you need people to create, maintain, and process metadata. You cannot have a library without decent metadata. This is a hill I will die on. So here's another truth. The current environment makes it impossible for a library to operate without patron data. Libraries rely on patron data for a lot of functions, such as keeping track of item circulation and providing access to electronic resources. What complicates this truth is that a patron cannot use the library nowadays without generating data, um, without, without going through and avoiding generating data. So, a patron's entrance into the physical library is captured by a door counter or a card swipe. A patron's movements in the library are tracked through security cameras. If a patron has a smartphone, that Wi-Fi might log the device, or a Bluetooth beacon searching for phones in range in the library. Now, we can complicate this even further by mentioning that the phone's signal and location are being tracked by, that third part, by a third party, but we will get back to that. The patron's computer use is captured through the computer reservation system and possibly the computer itself, logging any applications that were used and web activity through specific browsers. Network activity generates data through system logs, be it on the computer or through the Wi-Fi, and the print management system is recording patron activity through its own system logs. Now, did I mention that the security camera is recording that computer area, including the computer screens? I am not done yet. The, the copier's memory storage retains the scanned images of a patron's document. The smart speaker that sits on the information desk can pick up conversations between patrons and library workers. And the heat sensors used for that big, beautiful digital display to indicate which areas of the library are busy or crowded capture patron body outlines. We can't forget about those RFID tags in the books, films, and audio materials that patrons check out at the self-checkout machine. 
there might be an RFID tag in that library card as well. And we also have to mention there is a library event going on in one of those meeting rooms where a library worker is recording and taking pictures of the event if the patron decides to attend. And then they'll be handed a feedback form for the events and I will stop there. This is just an example of what patron data can be generated through a visit to the physical library. Patrons using online library services generate data through visiting the library website, searching the catalog, accessing electronic resources, and so on. We can talk about web cookies, system logs, search logs, chat transcripts, email, social media comments. However, there's only so much time we have in this keynote talk, so I will leave it there. All that that I mentioned in the last slide is compounded by the outsourcing of library services and functions to third parties. The trend toward cloud-hosted products and services decreases the level control on the library side and increases the vendor's ability to collect, process, retain, and disclose patron data. Our libraries enable the generation of data exhaust, the trail of data created by patrons through their use of the library. This trail of data reveals who we are in terms of our behaviors, interests, and habits. It's near impossible to separate the person from the data that they generate. Even when, when we talk about data aggregation or when we describe data through metadata, we can still get a relatively accurate picture of the person gener generating that data. So in essence, we are data and the library has a lot of it. Oh, hold up. You, some of you might be saying, but Becky, we're librarians, trademarked, and we are charged as a profession to protect patron privacy. Okay, then let's find out what that exactly means. When we talk about privacy, we first need to talk about intellectual freedom. The American Library Association, or ALA, describes intellectual freedom as a fundamental right for people to access information without restriction. The relationship between intellectual freedom and U.S. librarianship came, quote unquote, ALA official, with the adoptions of the ALA Code of Ethics and the Library Bill of Rights in 1939. Now, 1939 was a busy year, and the introduction to the Library Bill of Rights to the ALA Council gives us a clue as to why that was. And I quote, today, indications in many parts of the world point to growing intolerance, suppression of free speech, and censorship affecting the rights of minorities and individuals, end quote. A majority of these threats to free speech and intolerance were in the form of government suppression and censorship, mostly overseas. Now, this doesn't mean that privacy only matters when government intrusion is involved, far from it. However, it's hard to untangle privacy from intellectual freedom due to the historical intertwining of the two. Privacy in libraries is essential, but if you ask library workers why it's critical, you're more likely to encounter intellectual freedom and protection against government intrusion as two reasons why that is. There has been a shift in recent years regarding the importance of libraries protecting patron privacy um, and particularly patron data from exploitation by third parties. One example is Article 7 of the ALA Library Bill of Rights, adopted in 2019. Article 7 states that all people, regardless of origin, age, background, or views, possess a right to privacy and confidentiality in their library use. Libraries should advocate for, educate about, and protect people's privacy, safeguarding all library use data including personally identifiable information. This is just one of the recent efforts around patron privacy from ALA's Choose Privacy Every Day and Library Privacy Guidelines to various efforts and organizations such as the Library Freedom Project. This work led to changes in general awareness of issues to privacy, to, to privacy services to patrons. And all these are welcome developments in patron privacy but the reality of patron data is that it's like glitter. It's everywhere and it's hard to wrangle. 
the patron data generated through library use goes through a life cycle. There are six stages in that cycle, collection, storage, access, reporting, retention, and deletion. Each stage has a certain amount of risk attached to it. So let's take the first stage, which is collection. The data you decide to collect will determine what harm is caused if that data is leaked or breached. If you don't collect the data, it can't be leaked, breached, or improperly used. Collecting driver's license numbers in the patron record, for example, puts patrons at risk for identity theft. We can mitigate risk by limiting data collection to just data that is tied to a demonstrated business need. So in this case, why do we need to collect driver's license numbers? Sometimes a data collection question reflects the need to review a policy or process. We don't need a government issued ID number on file if the business need of the process is to verify a patron's physical address. And in fact, a driver's license requirement will create a barrier for patrons who don't have those licenses. Instead, we can change the address verification process to creating a note in the patron record um, stating that staff verified the address without collecting additional data, such as that license number. And all, some of this data that libraries collect is needed for library operations. At the same time, other data, such as our driver's license numbers in the earlier example, are not essential for operations. Unfortunately, libraries are not consistent in determining which is which. This is partly due to the pressure to use data to prove one's worth or value to others. Without data, it's hard for a library to build and sustain support from the administration, government officials, taxpayers, donors, and other decision makers. The need for data feeds into data FOMO, or fear of missing a data point that could be used to justify the existence of a project service or the library. We tend to collect data because we think, you know, it might be helpful. So, we don't have a solid case for collecting it now. There's also the argument that patrons should not worry about data collection and processing because librarianship has a robust code of ethics. Increasingly, we place ourselves in the role of information fiduciary, claiming to have our patrons' best interests in mind in our dealings with their data. So as long as we stay true, to our ethics, there should be no problem, correct? Data collected is data at risk. A typical example of this risk plays out in how this risk plays out in libraries is malware. So for example, for our academic libraries out there, y'all have to worry about silent librarian, a malware attack that creates fake library emails to fish library patrons for user credentials. Providing the bad actors access to the organization's internal network and assets, which includes sensitive data. The vendors we work with collect patron data for their own purposes. Vendors go beyond web analytic software to collect patron data through the use of proxy services, third party integrations, user accounts, and so on. All this data could be used to create user profiles or resold to other third parties. In some instances, like LexisNexis contracting with ICE. Vendors that collect patron data put patrons at risk by creating and selling harmful products built on the data collected from those very patrons. However, some of our own practices and house practices can be as evasive as a malware attack or a data hungry third party app. We surveil patrons through security cameras, for example, Many library privacy state laws don't explicitly state if security camera footage of a patron's use of library resources, such as recording that patron's internet browsing session on a public computer screen, is protected from disclosure like information in the patron's circulation record. We're replacing real world connections with data. What traditionally has been a two-way relationship between the library and community comes, becomes a commodified one-way relationship 
or libraries market services to patrons based on which segments patrons belong to. Now, vendors have been doing this for a very long time, but more recent is the adoption of Customer Relationship Management Systems, or CRMs, by libraries wanting to combine patron data with external data sets, mostly from data brokers. This gives libraries access to personal data about their patrons well beyond what's asked for on the library registration process, such as income, education level, race, ethnicity, gender identity, religion, political affiliation, and sexuality. Libraries can choose from a variety of CRMs and data analytics products from library vendors. For many libraries deciding to purchase these products, this purchase is a response to being stuck in the reality that demands data to prove our worth. But we can justify this. As long as we stay true to our ethics, there shouldn't be a problem. Yeah? We don't have to go far back to answer this question. In 2019, the Santa Cruz County Civil Grand Jury investigated the Santa Cruz Public Library System and their use of a data analytics and market segmentation product. The jury found that the library violated patron privacy expectations as well as professional ethics and standards in their use of the product. What makes this report worthy of attention in the library world is that this investigation was not done by library workers. It wasn't done by ALA. It wasn't done by any other library, professional library body. But it was done by people who could be very well be patrons of that public library. So getting called out on privacy issues by patrons is not the best look for libraries who keep talking about library privacy and ethics. Libraries keep saying that privacy in the library ultimately serves the patron. I don't know that as a profession, if we are in consensus of that. This is partly due to the ethics we keep referring to when we talk about library privacy. When we talk about library ethics, we talk about the various statements from the ALA Code of Ethics, like Article 3, about protecting a patron's right to privacy while using library materials. But I think there's a better way to start figuring out what we mean when we talk about library ethics that goes, that, that goes beyond going line by line through each article. The following sentences come from the opening of the ALA Code of Ethics, and I quote, we significantly influence or control the selection organization, preservation, and dissemination of information. And a political system grounded in a informed citizenry, we are members of a profession explicitly committed to intellectual freedom and the freedom of access to information." End quote. This follows the same arguments and emphasis on intellectual freedom and knowing what would be in the patron's best interests. But in addition, we must practice a high level of neutrality concerning our selection and distribution, again, in the best interest of the patrons, lest we endanger our professional duty, our ability to create informed citizen patrons. And here, my audience, we meet that one term that has defined library ethical discussions, and that is neutrality. The Code of Ethics does not shy away from neutrality as a core ethical standard, um, such as Article 7, stating that personal convictions shouldn't conflict with professional duties. So if we oversimplified the Code of Ethics, libraries are called to provide unfettered, confidential access to a wide range of different ideas regardless of the personal beliefs of the library worker, to create an informed citizenry that is vital to our modern democracy. So like most of you might, the, might not be very happy with that summary. It doesn't really clearly define library ethics, but perhaps that's by design. Ethics are notoriously hard to define. What might be ethical to one person, might not be ethical to another. Library ethics is not immune from this squishiness. Nonetheless, humans 
like having binaries. Tell us what is ethical and what is not. Okay, so we're going to do that. Let's talk about what ethics actually are and what they are not. Ethics are not values. They are not goals. They are not vision statements. Ethics is, as former U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice Potter Stewart puts it, knowing the difference between what you have the right to do and what is right to do. Ethics is doing the right thing even when no one is looking. Ethics is recognizing the differences between the consequences of what you consider is right and what others consider is right. Ethics is moral justice. Equally as importantly, ethics is harm reduction. Bringing this back to library ethics, you might start to notice why we can't have a conversation about patron privacy without acknowledging the harm created by our actions. Libraries are a product of society. For example, the early public libraries in the US served in part as the place for quote unquote uneducated immigrants can be educated in the proper social norms of the dominant social class. Libraries aid in the patriotic mission of cultiv cultivating that informed citizenry. But we exclude minoritized groups through unjust rules and policies. Libraries are defenders of intellectual freedom to the point where speech that incites violence against patrons and library workers alike is not only allowed, but welcomed into library spaces. We provide access to a variety of information. We claim to provide access to a variety of information, but this information that we provide access to doesn't reflect our community's diversity. We hyper-focus on one way to organize information at the exclusion of equally valid knowledge systems. It's important to be aware that libraries reflect the society in terms of the norms and beliefs of privileged and dominant groups. As a concept, neutrality serves as keeping that status quo for those who are privileged or in the dominant groups. Nonetheless, we still need to suss out the library question, privacy question regarding who benefits when libraries choose to use privacy invasive practices and technologies. Some of you might be stopping me right here because you, you would probably be saying at this point, the issue is how we use that technology and not the technology itself. So in, in essence, technology is neither ethical or unethical. It's neutral. This is where I introduce you to that wall of research stating that technology is not neutral. The creators of many algorithms and technologies argue that these systems are objective and unbiased. Ruha Benjamin counters this technology as objective narrative with the concept of, of the new gym code, defined as the employment of new technologies that reflect and reproduce existing in inequities that are promoted and perceived as more objective or progressive than the discriminatory systems of a previous era. Pick any book or movie listed on the slide. You'll be flooded with examples of how facial recognition software can't accurately capture and, not, and identify non-white faces. You'll learn how search engines return images of mugshots when searching for pictures of groups of black teenagers, when a search for groups of white teenagers produces little to no mugshots in those results. You'll learn that pre per, um, personal assistants like Siri were programmed to make jokes or make snappy comebacks but they weren't programmed to help someone searching for help after a sexual assault or an episode of domestic violence. You'll find countless stories of how algorithms deny people jobs, insurance, desperately needed medical care, and housing because the algorithms and the data used to drain the algorithms are biased towards certain races, ethnicities, gender identities, sexualities, and disabilities. You'll find that even just someone's identity, someone's name, 
can disqualify them from opportunities if the name is not a common white sounding name or a typical man's name, even if the person is more qualified than their white male counterparts. The technologies we create reflect who we are, what we believe, and what we value. Open source is also a product of society and carries the biases, beliefs, and values of those who shape the movement. Open source is collaborative, but also meritocratic to a fault. People can participate in open source in many ways, but contributions are usually valued based on a hierarchy that places code at top. Many want to be a part of the open source community. Still, the community's actions have made it clear that they're not welcomed, ranging from microaggressions to community tolerance of abusers. We cannot create neutral technology for neutral libraries because neither is neutral. Open source communities can't release a product out to the world and then absolve themselves of any harm from the use of that product. This is another myth of neutrality in tech. How the tech is used is the user's problem and not the creator's. As companies and businesses are scrutinized and theoretically face consequences if their products are used for harm, open source communities can and should be subject to the same scrutiny and consequences. So what happens when we remove that rotting dead weight that is neutrality from ethics and tech. It forces us to start thinking about how we affect the health, safety, and well-being of people in our communities. And in that sense, many people in open source do make that effort. Open source communities are no stranger to advocacy. Entire communities center around ideas and values such as digital equity, accessibility, and privacy. In terms of library privacy, open source communities and libraries can and have, to certain extents, created systems that don't trade patron privacy for functionality, like their proprietary counterparts. However, we can only go so far with just only library ethics to help guide library open source communities. One path to harm reduction is licensing that requires developers and users to abide by ethical standards and principles. This is illustrated by the current efforts of by the Organization for Ethical Source. Currently, there are seven principles guiding this effort, and you see those on the slide. So we have ethical source, common good, accessibility, safety, compensation, community, and last but not least, privacy. However, all these licenses can only go so far in harm reduction particularly when we get into the practicalities. Legal enforcement of licenses is costly. It's also very hard to get a community, to get a document to list all uses that are and are not allowed, even if they're guidelines. It's notoriously hard to get that to be agreed upon. The ethical source movement is heading in a good direction. But for some of us, we might mean need something more concrete or, or something more immediate. Here we can turn to the integration of ethics in the design process. By integrating ethics into each stage of the development's life cycle, we have greater control to create technology and processes that align with ethics. The Ethical Design Guide provides various tools and resources about developing technology based on inclusive design principles and reducing harm embedded in a system's design. This guide is a great source to learn about ethics and concepts that otherwise are not represented in our own codes. The Ethical OS Toolkit is another resource that developers can use to identify ethical issues through eight risk zones, including surveillance, bias, data control, and monetization. By identifying potential ethical problems with the technology early on in the development process, developers can remedy these issues before deployment. And I do include these URLs on the slide, but they're also in the, um, in the Sotero library that I linked earlier on in the beginning of the presentation. Nonetheless, we still need to address how libraries use this technology within the data lifecycle. We have to acknowledge that the practices around technology 
are as important as the creation of technology. So it is both the creator and the user that need to be involved in this. We also need to talk about inheritance. At the beginning of library automation, the digital library systems mirrored the analog systems we created to organize information straight down to the formatting from the cards in the library card catalog. And to an extraordinary extent, we still live with that legacy. It's Conway's law all the way down. Conway's law is short. The systems we build reflect our organizational systems and communications. Our organizations are shaped by values, beliefs, biases, and ethics. What we decide to adopt from other industries or from other tech fields also have their own inheritances, their own Conway's law of reflecting the human structures and biases of its creators. Libraries adherence to neutrality as ethical standard leads our systems to create harm. An example of this inheritance and bias problem is library discovery systems. Our profession treats information retrieval as a neutral act, which ignores the effects these systems have on our patrons. Matthew Reedsrow has documented various examples of bias in library discovery systems in his recent book, Masked by Trust, Bias in Library Discovery. When you have search results about hearsay in the US, for a search about rape in the US, or you get back general US culture results, when you specifically search for rape culture in the US, it's hard to argue that our discovery systems can't cause harm. Another inheritance problem we have is the way our systems generally deal with data. So for example, why in the year 2021 are we still finding gender identity data fields in the ILS patron record? Why do libraries believe that having the gender identity of the patron is essential for the patron to use the library? Why do we have systems and processes in place that make it impossible for patrons to avoid creating a massive amount of data exhaust, even with the smallest of library interactions. It's clear that this is a multifaceted problem. So how do we realistically mitigate harm to our patrons? Welcome to the world of data ethics. In the privacy world, we talk about different breaches, such as security and data breaches, ethics breaches, are the failure to handle data consistent with organizational or professional values. Data ethics can help you minimize the risk of an ethics breach. One general definition of data ethics is the behavioral norms that inform decisions and actions around data collection, management, and use. It is a holistic approach in determining the impact of our data decisions. There are a few common threads in various data ethics frameworks, including transparency and accountability in decisions around data use and following industry ethics and best practices, such as data minimization. Data ethics frameworks share the charge to put context around data management to focus on how this management impacts individuals behind this data, including different impacts on different populations. Data ethics considers the power dynamics between the user and the organization, and the organizations that are in a way, they are in a position to take advantage of user data in ways that harm users. So here's a quick litmus test that you can do at your very own library. Tell your patrons what your actual data practices are. Don't show them your pol privacy policy or point them to the Library Bill of Rights or the Code of Ethics, but clearly explain what, your, what actually happens in the patron data lifecycle at your library, including patron data that's fed into vendor systems. So if your patrons respond with, you did what with my data? you have a possible ethics breach. This is what happened at Santa Cruz Public Library. 
and why they were investigated by the civil grand jury. Even if Santa Cruz used an open source version of a CRM or had complete control over the data lifecycle, the act of creating that user profile can still be considered an ethics breach. This still falls under the fallacy that libraries will default on doing what is right for the patron instead of what the library has the right to do. Data ethics requires us to confront the truth of how easy it is to center the organization's needs and rights over the rights of the people. The data fields in a market segmentation or an analytics product are there waiting to be filled and analyzed, and it's easy to not stop and ask why the process requires that data. It's also easy to not question why you believe data would be better um, than talking to your patrons if you wanted to understand them. And it's also even easier to forget that your patron data reflects who is using the library and not the entire community that you're supposed to serve as a library. We forget that data is not neutral and that our analysis will reflect the biases of the technology and processes used to collect and analyze the data. And we forget that patron data analysis isn't really that far removed from surveillance. We can acknowledge the truth about the harms we can create through analytics, but we can still be complicit. At my former workplace, we had a data warehouse for reporting and analytical purposes. We did our best in minimizing harm through risk assessments of what types of data should be included in that warehouse, implementing strict data security measures, excluding raw patron data, and conducting re-identification tests on our de-identification methods. The risks were still there, but a combination of having a big enough service population where the risk of re-identifying de-identified data was limited and having the time and resources to identify and integrate risk mitigation controls made the data warehouse far less problematic, but not wholly unproblematic. And this is for a large urban library. Many libraries have demographic outliers or they have small service populations, which make many de-identification methods not viable. In addition, re-identification is possible if the data has enough lingering patron data, particularly data about patrons' activity and is combined with other data sets. So yeah, I you can identify a patron with only the location, time of checkout or use, and the resource used or checkout in a collection use report. So from there, I can look for patterns of checkouts of related topics or subjects, location and time of day to create a, a rough profile. So if I want to get more specific, I can also connect those data points to other data points in different data sets. Suppose I gain access to geolocation data from that mobile phone carrier mentioned at the beginning of the talk, or even access to the IP address or other um, unique data from my electronic device so I can create a digital fingerprint. In that case, I not only can identify the patron, but I know what they're reading to the degree that I can exploit this knowledge through non-consensual behavioral marketing or reselling this newly constructed user profile to data brokers. We can't make problematic processes unproblematic solely on good intentions. And this is where we seem like we never get make it past that point in the discourse. It's like the Ever Given in the Suez Canal. The library ship is stuck and the privacy advocates are trying to unmoor that profession. We have people out there in the field who are tirelessly working to get the profession moving out of this stuck position around data privacy and ethical practices. Groups such as the Library Freedom Project and the cohorts from the Library Freedom Institute 
projects such as Data Doubles and DLF's Privacy and Ethics and Technology and even the efforts of several ALA subcommittees and working groups. They're all working towards a more ethical and privacy-preserving library data management model. But we can only do so much by ourselves. The ship ain't moving, unless there's a coordinated effort between tugboats. It only takes a handful of tugboats to steer the largest of ships, as we've seen with the Ever Given. Now, I don't have definite answers, but I have some ideas about how the library open source community tugboat section can help li the librarianship boat to get it moving again. First, let's focus on the software design process with privacy by default. Privacy by default takes the embedded approach by privacy by design, which asks for privacy to be considered at each stage of a process or project. And it makes it explicit in defaulting any process or system to the highest level of privacy or mitigation strategies. For example, patrons could change user settings to the level of privacy they're comfortable with. Still, all user accounts in the patron-facing system would start with the highest level of privacy possible in that system. Speaking of patron accounts, we have to acknowledge the reality. Some of our patrons want our systems to keep their borrowing history. They want to have safe searches or search alerts and other types of data tracking so they can personalize their library experience. The library doesn't need access to this data though. In fact, the more data we keep, the higher the risk of privacy harms and ethics breaches. So here, we can look at zero-knowledge encryption. Encryption in library technology is mixed at best, particularly for core systems such as the ILS. While there might be encryption of data in transit, the library can still access the stored encrypted data if the library has a copy of that decryption key. Zero-knowledge has one decryption key. And that key stays with the user and not the library. Any encrypted data stored in the system can only be decrypted by the user. This would remove the library's access to patron data and eliminate several privacy risks around data access, retention, and secondary use. Zero knowledge architecture brings up an ex excellent question for library technology. What data in our systems do libraries really need access to? And what data can exist in our systems without having to be out in the open for the library to access? We covered some ethical design tools and frameworks in this presentation that could be incorporated into planning, development, and maintenance cycles. These resources can also be used to re review existing technologies through audits and maintenance or enhancement cycles. You have a lot of flexibility with these resources in terms of integration to processes. So go forth, play, research, try what works. If it doesn't, try another. Nevertheless, we can talk about development frameworks, encryption, privacy controls. All of this can only go so far. We need community mechanisms in place which are not in place in librarianship at this point. We need mechanisms in place that provide transparency and accountability. This includes how our library open source systems meet existing library data ethics and privacy standards, how these systems are reviewed, and what should happen if a system fails to live up to those ethics or standards. This could include a governance group or a working group that sets the ethical and privacy standards for community work, um, regularly reviews the ethical and privacy implications of systems developed by the community, and oversees the investigation of possible ethics breaches. At my Code for Lib 2015 talk about the intersections of libraries and technologies, I asked the question to the library technology community, what exactly is the world that we are making? and does it match the world we want to make? And so six years later, I'm gonna ask that same question to you all. What is the world we want to make? 
is in a world where we can lead the way in creating privacy-preserving systems? Or is it one where we collaborate with library privacy advocates in creating privacy and data ethics standards and accountability systems that are so desperately needed for our profession? Is it, is it a world where we, as a collective, push back against this narrative that data is a commodity to be mined and exploited to ensure the institution's survival? Or do we dare to have all three worlds in one? Special thanks to Galen Charlton and Dorothea Silo for helping shape this talk. Again, you can find me at my email and at Twitter if you'd like to continue the conversation. I want to thank you all for joining us today. And thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and I look forward to continuing the discussion online. Again, thank you. Thank you so much, Becky. That was wonderful. And I'm actually looking forward to going back and, and uh, doing the recording again after I've had a little time to kind of think through and digest. Uh, so the uh, talk will be up in on YouTube in a few weeks uh, because Becky has graciously agreed to uh, include that in her licensing. So you can look forward to that. The exhibit halls, I believe, are opening today at noon. So go ahead and head over there and check out some of our exhibitors. And we'll see you back for sessions this afternoon. Thanks everyone and have a wonderful rest of your conference.